Um, shall I jump straight in? <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our Elements Symposium of Architecture, 3000, 4000, 5000, and Education of the Future, but now. <laughs> and uh, today we are so honored. We are with Dr. Harriet Harris from New York. And I'm so happy to, to be with you today. May I introduce you? Dr. Harriet is a UK licensed architect. She's a writer and historian, and she's a dean of the Pratt School of Architecture in New York. And as well, and why I'm so glad we are with you, because you're a pioneer of new pedagogic models of, for design education and focus of the need to broaden participation and diversity in architecture and much more. I made it short. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you very much, Naomi. It's actually lovely to be here. Um, I'll jump straight in because I know we are tight on time. So um, thank you again for inviting me to talk about my perspectives on the future of architecture. And I'll speak for the next 20 minutes, kicking off with um, a bit of a story about some of my research and publications. So um, when I first um, decided to become an academic, I was actually running a practice that I set up while I was still a student. So my relationship with the architecture industry was in a way unusual because I was in some ways mounting a protest about architecture's emphasis on commercialism and its lack of civic engagement and its lack of diversity, both in terms of the profile of the profession um, and that obviously concerns both race and gender and other forms of identity, but also in terms of the people that it served most keenly. So stepping back into education some decade or so after I had been in professional practice was really because I realized the extent to which um, pedagogy programs the profession. We are in schools incredibly, in a, in a very incredibly powerful position regarding shaping what the future profession can be. And in fact, many of the inequalities that the profession suffers from are really embedded within our curriculum because of exclusions, for example, to the canon. Um, uh, mm -hmm. They are, if you like, represented by a lack of diversity in our faculties and also by implication, a lack of diversity in our student bodies. And even though we have 50% female, for example, students joining schools of architecture, only we still only have about 20 to 30% of architects registered as female, both in the UK and the US. So pedagogy is implicated which is why, in my view, if you want to be at the absolute avant-garde of designing the future of architecture, then you should be in education. So my books, here are some pictures of front covers um, in case anyone wants to read any of them, but it started with life projects, again, resituating education outside of institutions and working with communities. Radical pedagogies talked about the need to start understanding what, what we have in common, what's progressive and what's radical, meaning root. In other words, core, or, um, what are our values in relation to architectural production education. I've written history books such as the Greta Magnuson Grossman one, which again is about returning an excluded woman to architecture's canon. Um, and other books that look at um, moving beyond the Western context to look to global South pedagogies and also questions of gender and representation in architecture. So, you know, we're here to talk about the future of education to some extent, and uh, and and I think that it's one has to think a bit about, well, what future is there necessarily? So we like we love to think that architecture will just keep you know, lasting into the future, but we don't really know. Um, what we do know about architecture is that it is has got to be one of the most interesting undergraduate and um, and also most powerful undergraduate degrees because it's really the love child of many other disciplines in that it draws intelligence from so many different epistemologies, meaning um, bodies of knowledge, but it's also got an ability to synthesize and work between lots of different methodologies, lots of different outcomes. And in many ways, that's what makes architects and architecture students incredibly fortunate because you have an agility, no matter what the future is, to kind of bounce between all these modes of operation that will serve you well independent of what professional context you end up in. But there are others, some other questions we need to consider really if we want to, if we're having a very, very serious discussion about what the future of architecture is. And that's really whether or not we'll last at all as a profession. So for example, professions are a modern invention. Architecture is a profession, it's not even 200 years old. So it's relatively recent in relation to many disciplines and ways of doing things. Medicine, for example, is you know, thousands of years old. So it's interesting then to think about what we can, what we can potentially or what role we might play in the future of, of, of the world, but also in relation to whether or not we'll survive into the residual 15% of jobs we'll, we'll be doing in 15 years time. We also know that architectures relies heavily on automation 
um, such as CAD and BIM and things like that. So, you know, when those technologies take over, what will be left in many ways as these technologies advance and have, if you like, incursions onto what architecture's function is. Um, and of course, you know, again, our role gets diminished. We also know that we have an even bigger kind of broader crisis that isn't just tech driven, um, but very much about the climate in which we all exist. So we are at the moment five degrees away from another mass extinction, the sixth in fact, um, in the last five um, extinctions, by the way, the majority of life got, gets completely wiped out between 74% and 92% of life on the planet. So again, we might think about will, will architecture survive as a profession when in a way the bigger question to ask is will people, will humans even survive? past the next extinction. So um, we also know that architects um, don't necessarily by default have an ethical heart. We are the main consumers of rainforest timber. We are also within our supply chains. In other words, the materials we use to design buildings and make buildings that specify for the interiors. We have, there are a number of slaves working to extract those minerals. Um, it's what um, Catherine Yusuf describes as the, the racialized underground, because it's typically people of color working in poor countries that provide all the raw minerals, often under um, systems of exploitation and hardship um, and even child labor to get us the materiality we need to do our architectural innovations. Um, every year, 30,000 new products, obviously some of them related to architecture go onto the market. I'm not sure what I'd do with 30,000 new things in my house other than be forced to move out. But the point being, we're always operating towards a generative outcome. The, this consumption-driven culture in which we live is one of the reasons why the planet is collapsing. So again, what does that mean for designers and architects? Well, broadly, it means what can we do with what we have, right? Um, and of course, we also know that even industries like um, fashion design, but obviously architects and designers specify fabrics all the time, um, have a huge impact on landfill and a fossil fuel derived. So we have to get oil out the ground in order to produce these things. And as a consequence of that, we can't just blame aviation or people who drive cars for in the, the decline of the environment. And of course, the really terrifying statistic is, and this is a 2019 statistic, that there was a prediction that even within the space of six years, when we know we are already overheating, we've seen the evidence of climate damage and, and, and you know many species coming extinct, we are still, part of an industry that is contributing um, to construction waste you know, at a huge rate. It's deeply troubling to think of our complicity in relation to environmental collapse. And for those people trapped at home watching this on Zoom, you know, we're actually, even though we're not flying to conferences, I've not flown to give this you know, presentation at a, 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 a real-time conference, we're still using the internet to participate and actually that's a big CO2 generator too. And of course, the devices on which we're watching this particular presentation also generate e-waste, um, electrical item waste, which is a huge part of landfill, but also typically gets burned, increasing CO2. And of course, we also know that humans have a really destructive attitude towards all creatures. Um, there's only 16% of the world's animals left in the world. And on top of that, the majority of animals have been wiped out by us already. By the way, of the, six, of the remaining um, 82, sorry, 84% of animals that are not currently in the world, they're actually in abattoirs um, waiting for us to kill them and eat them. Um, so when we talk a little bit about this idea of a post-Anthropocene, the Anthropocene being you know, human dominance, the period of man or humankind, um, you know, we, there's a notion that actually maybe we need to move beyond post-Anthropocentric post thinking. In other words, to start to understand what would happen if we didn't put ourselves first all the time. So raises questions about who do we design for? Do we design for humans or do we design for other species to spare our space, share our spaces? Are we sensitive to the fact that buildings have gender biases, that they have racial biases, that architecture, such as border walls between Mexico and the US, have been complicit in enforcing segregation and partition from refugee camps to concentration camps? Invariably, we have been active, or architecture has been active, in asserting divisions between humans and other species. And of course, regionalism, what we do know is that the consumption in the global north vastly produce, contaminates, and shortens the lives of people um, in the global south at a far more rapid rate. So our recycling that we're not that worried about, all the bags we throw in the street, the trash cans, whatever, um, it, it feels like a, a kind of problem that somebody tidies away, but they tidy it away to a country um, where that waste becomes a toxic hazard. So we need to understand really that architecture and all design is, is about reciprocity. It's not just, and this is a super important point, about the designer and the person who buys the product or lives in the house or wears the dress. It's about the origins of those 
those materials and the resources and the kind of, you know, the capital attached to that. So extracting minerals, harvesting rainforests, whatever it was that took you to get the materials needed to build your thing. And that's where we have, I think, a, a kind of limited understanding of what our responsibilities are. We talk about ethics in a facing forward kind of a way. We don't understand ethics in terms of the origins of the materials and everything else. And the humans involved in extracting those materials or the animals that died because we've cleared the rainforests um, in order to use the timber. So this book, interestingly, does not go into a dystopian realm, realm of climate collapse, but it, I want to talk a little bit about it because what I want to say is, you know, many of times I will hear students say that they're a bit worried about doing an art design degree because some of their parents have said to them, can't be a great degree because you should go and do engineering or, or become a doctor or whatever it is, because actually, you know, our creative degrees, you know, there's, you know, very unstable. You never know if you're going to get a job. Well, my argument, as you saw from my drawing earlier, is that architecture and design draws from so many different disciplines. There's such an interdisciplinary heart to being a designer that actually we need to understand better about how most designers um, move between lots of different sectors and spheres of influence. So this book was really designed to, and this is a summary of the different um, contributors, you know, from obviously a lot from the US, Australia, UK, and so on. And, and this is a way we kind of tried to explain how their fields of operation. So in plus, they're like on the edge of architecture, doing community engagement work or really quite radical architectural work that's, um, you know, involved working in some cases um, with refugees. And then into kind of a far more beyond space, which was much more around um, doing work that where there wasn't necessarily buildings as an output, so still using architectural intelligence and design processes, but working in a completely creative way. Um, for example, one you know a company called Architekis who was set up to rehabilitate architects to get them into a tech careers rather than build buildings. Um, and these are the different categories we created um, for the way in which we structured the chapters and the contributors. So the book really was trying to break down some misapprehensions that if you go and become an architect, you have to work as a slave in a traditional office for years and years doing CAD and being bored to tears. What we tried to show is that people with architecture degrees were generating really profound social change without resorting to a building. They won't use the building Tourette's problem of just going building. The answer is a building no matter what. What they were doing instead was thinking about non-spatial things in this case, creating a system where somebody can have a virtual address in order to qualify for benefits and apply for jobs, which was Chris um, Hildry's work with Proxy Address with Rotor, Belgium-based architecture firm. What they were doing was deconstructing a building before they constructed it. So coming back to this question of supply chain, what they were doing is basically the zombie harvesting buildings in order to make new spaces. So there was no need to kind of bring in new materials and fabrics. Joel Sanders' work on understanding that toilets aren't just perfunctory, they are social spaces that program us to behave in certain ways towards other genders, towards people with disabilities, towards people with different sexualities and so on. So how do you use our architecture and design as an agency for better relationships, more equitable and tolerant understandings of everyone's differences? Um, obviously the book featured activists because so many people in the architecture sphere, as you know, are very active politically on a number of levels. This is a um, just, sorry, this is Parla from Australia who did a lot, lot of work around women in, in architecture. Peggy Deemer's work, she's at Yale and she's really interested in the idea of unionizing, so fair pay for architectural workers, not just architects, there's a lot of people in the industry. Um, if you haven't already checked out the work of Forensic Architecture, obviously they won the Turn Prize last year, so super mm -hmm. interesting people, but architecture for them is a justice project. What they do is they use architectural methodologies to capture um, by scanning buildings and understand um, who bombed who and, and using these forensics hold governments and regimes to account for um, the loss of human, human, human life um, and, and actually in many ways perpetrations on, on the part of regimes. Um, and so they work on the, on the kind of cutting edge of using almost um, forensics, the forensics of architectural modeling and capture as a means to create a sort of system of justice for these regions. Assemble, of course, they were previously Turner Prize winners several years ago, but this is again looking to this idea of you don't have to go into a hierarchical practice model, you can create a collective which is horizontal and everyone is equal and it's deeply interdisciplinary. So again, architects working with fashion designers, textile designers, product designers and so on. And that's how um, an artist, of course, and that's that kind of community of por porosity, if you like, between these different disciplinary practices. And of course, in Robert Mull's case with the Global Free Unit, recognising architecture can provide immediate um, so, uh, solutions to crises such as having a refugee camp bull bulldozed. So this is Sangat refugee camp in Calais, both he and I used to work there on separate initiatives and one day the French government just turned up with a bulldozer and leveled the whole thing. So there was an immediate need 
to find as people to have shelter after this occurred. Um, in Joss Boy's example, she was a former member, a founding member of Muff, I'm sorry, not Muff Architects, uh, Matrix in the UK. She does a lot of work around, around these kind of bodies that are non-compliant, such as people with disabilities and how architecture is intentionally excludes them spatially. And interestingly, Miriam Bellard's work, um, it may be a surprise, in fact, that um, Grand Theft Auto was invented by a woman and not some spotty teenager eating Doritos on his father's sofa. But uh, um, the other thing about it is that she was an architecture student and so she's using her architectural thinking to create a game space um, and obviously the most highly regarded game of all time. So interesting again to think about all of these people have come from architecture and all of their processes and their outcomes are vastly different and in many cases, if not most cases, not a building. And that's what I want to say to the students really that, you know, you'll often expect or be told that you have to, you know, produce work um, for an industry as it is. And my challenge is that we don't have to do that, that you have a skill set when you study architecture and design that can migrate into all these different challenges. And that it's that ability to adapt, um, to transpose, to hop into new opportunities that makes you incredibly agile. We can't predict the future, of course. We can certainly have some sense of things relating to climate and economics and, and obviously social justice. But in fact, um, to have a really robust degree that could survive into a future really comes down to picking a creative degree such as architecture and design because it gives you that agility and that fluidity. So for architects especially, you should all be called architects whether or not you design buildings if you, once you graduate and, and obviously go out into the world and become architects of anything because that is the skill set that you gain in an architecture and design education, the ability to work across the disciplines, but also to solve problems and respond to three-dimensional challenges in ways that no other discipline can. Thank you. Well, thank you to you. Oh my God, that's so much information. <laughs> what, would, what would be your last piece of advice like the core piece of advice for the school of architecture around the world or for everybody looking at us right now during this symposium yeah what would be my advice about the, the future of architecture schools well you know i think for well if it's if it's advice to schools i think it really comes down to realizing that schools are a school is an environment not a necessarily a physical one it doesn't have to be a building or even situated with an institute a school is it really describes a community of people willing to share knowledge um, and also to acquire knowledge and that's what a school is fundamentally it doesn't have to have bricks and mortar around it and it's a, a community of people sharing those objectives i think that schools um, you know, the AA, for example, the Architectural Association in London, that started out incidentally as a group of students rebelling mm -hmm. against the fact that they were being exploited learning architecture because back then they couldn't study in an institution, they had to learn in practice, exclusively mm -hmm. in practice. And the, the practices were just keeping them on low wages and getting them to do all the hard work and never promoting them to the title of architect so they couldn't become independent. So it was a system of exploitation. So in the end, 24 year old and a 19 year old said, why don't we set up our own school? So long before Microsoft got there, they created an each one teach one model. We call that autodidactic, so student led. So everyone came with different pieces of knowledge from their experience with professional practice and they taught each other. So they did it in a completely free, but also equitable way. So I think my piece of advice for schools is that you do not necessarily need to be institutionally codependent um, mm -hmm. in order to produce a school, that a school can just be a group of people with a shared objective, but also crucially that to understand that every learner, whether or not they're in a bricks and mortar envelope or doing something in a field, um, is an equal. So a professor learns from their students to the same extent that a student learns from a professor. And any, any professor that doesn't really understand that is missing an opportunity to connect to what intelligence um, students bring into the dialogue of the traditional you know, student and I think that's what's so interesting that we have you know in in the conventions of professor student the, everyone is a student everyone's a professor everyone has moments of expertise mm -hmm. and it's really understanding how do you work with that knowledge to co-design new forms of knowledge knowledge isn't unassailable right knowledge is not a thing that you can't challenge the whole point of going to college is to say hey this mm -hmm. curriculum and this pedagogy is really racist or it's really biased towards men. We know that to be true in architecture, for example. So it's not there in, so on some pedestal. It's the knowledge is only valuable as when, it, when it retains its relevance, when it's no longer relevant and no one can relate to it. And it's not really knowledge anymore. It's an obsolete idea. So this is just, my, my final point was just that, that we can co-create knowledge, but we can, to do that, we have to deconstruct and reimagine the knowledge we've inherited. 
Beautiful, beautiful. So the keyword co-design, I love it. Now it's co-design, co-create, co-build, co-construct, everybody together. Beautiful. Dr. Harris, you are, you are, we are going to give you the first prize for having so much information in 20 minutes. You are a genius. Thank you Sorry. so much. That was a bit fast. <laughs> oh no, that's incredible. I really appreciate, we really appreciate this uh, beautiful information and uh, ask everybody to co-design, co-create, even in your family, in your job, and uh, of course, in architecture. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you, Nene. It's lovely to see you. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Thank you for your time.